Uh, so tonight on the docket was uh, talk about chapter nine licensing. Um, I was going to take on the, the discussion duties for this. Uh, here are the learning objectives for this evening before I get into um, kind of a few reminders and a couple other notes before I get started. But really tonight, my focus is to try and get us to understand the differences between permissive licenses and copyleft licenses. Uh, also, I'm going to focus on trying to um, facilitate our understanding on what to do when we're licensing our own code for our packages, um, what we need to do in regards for license, licensing code received from other people. So an example of that be if somebody contributes in some way through like a pull request or something like that. We'll talk about licensing other people's codes that you bundle into your own package. Uh, we already kind of had a little bit of that conversation last week with Rex, uh, his question last week. So hopefully you can shed some more light or provide some more answers to that. Then uh, we're, we should be able to describe how the copyright holder is determined in this process of package development. And then the last thing is to discuss the process involved in the cases when we need to relicense a package. So uh, unfortunately, we can't do the warm up tonight because I've already gone over my five minutes, but uh, I'll, I'll bear everybody the pain of telling me your favorite karaoke song. But um, if you want to share in the chat, please do. And then we can talk about it afterwards. <laughs> um, so just a few reminders for you for the session. Uh, if we need to slow down and discuss, just let me know. This group's really good about it. So don't be afraid to interrupt, you know, raise your hand or you don't have to raise your hand, just jump in. Um, if you have a question, most likely somebody else will have that same question. And I really think that the discussions and the questions is where we really kind of learn a lot. And so don't be afraid to, um, uh, you know, ask any questions, whenever. Most people are good about the camera, so I don't need to talk about that. Uh, you know, everybody understands that the sessions are recorded. And then this one just popped up. I think John Harmon put this in um, for my last reminders, but you know, there's a pin in the Slack channel if you want to look up the schedule and signups. And so stuff related to the specific channel and the specific group are pinned in the channel if you want to check it out. Um, we'll talk about uh, what's coming up next for the group um, once we get finished with tonight's discussion. So um, to start off, with this discussion tonight, I have to give a disclaimer. Uh, disclaimer for this group and also because this is gonna be posted on YouTube uh, for pretty much anybody to access. And we're starting to get into, um, we're starting into getting into a topic that brings in like the law. And so I just wanna make it very clear that if somebody's watching this in the future and for this group tonight, any of the information that I share tonight is not legal advice. Um, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> and in fact, if you're getting legal advice from me, I highly suggest you not to use that advice. So uh, my depth of understanding and knowledge in this area is from reading one chapter and some supplementary materials. So that means if you have questions about this, you have concerns, uh, most likely I will get something wrong. And in those cases, your job is to seek out consultation from a legal professional. Um, so again, although we're gonna talk about these topics, and um, some of them seem very clear. Some of them might be very gray based on your specific situation. So go seek out that professional help. But really, instead of trying to provide legal advice, which I am not, our focus really for tonight is going to be trying to inform each other on the topics in the context or licensing, uh, the licensing topic in the context of our package development, and then preparing ourselves to ask the right questions if we do have concerns. So if we have to have to go have a conversations with our legal team, or we have to have a conversation with a legal profession regarding our licensing, we know what types of questions to ask. And then the last thing is to prepare us to do the right thing when we're using other people's code, um, because there's some, there's some questions about um, licensing compatibility when it gets into open source software that we have to come across. And one thing that I learned from this reading is not all open source licensing is compatible with each other. And so we have to take that into consideration. And so really preparing what we do when someone tries to contribute um, to our projects and provides us um, some contribution. So. so to kind of get started off, we're gonna start off, I really wanted to start off with kind of what the book was starting off with was software licensing. Uh, it's a complicated field. Um, there was a couple quotes that I pulled from the book and some other um, sources and materials out there. This one kind of puts everything into context. 
you know, software licensing is a large and complicated field made particularly complex because it lies at the intersection of programming and law. And so that was written by Hadley in this book. Um, the other thing is, is that if you go a little bit further and read the documentation writing our, our extensions, um, licensing, licensing for a package which might be distributed is an important but potentially complex sub subject. And I never really thought about this. And there's a couple of examples of here why we should think about this. But a couple of things when I was reading, I was like, oh, this is kind of a very important thing to consider. And then the other thing, this was a quote from Colin Fay in Licensing R, which I'll kind of reference a couple a little bit tonight, is that copyright is everywhere. And so we need to be aware that the stuff that we're creating or the stuff that other people create is going to be under copyright. And so we need to understand how to properly use that stuff so that we don't find ourselves, one, in legal trouble, two, to, and to also protect ourselves in situations so that we kind of limit our liability in certain situations. So although it's complex, it's important. You know, the first thing is, is that if you just say, you know what, I'm just going to make my code freely available with no licensing. Uh, the, the book highly suggests not doing that because not including a license could legally mean users can't distribute your package or code. Um, there are certain situations that your code may not be able to be used because you don't have a license. And then the other thing is users may not be able to technically use your package if you don't have a license. The other thing that I thought was kind of interesting, and then this was more talked about in Colin Fay's licensing for R, is that the license you choose is going to dictate the level of permission that you give your other users to use your code. And so if you make your code freely available, completely open source, um, and I'm going to consider open source completely freely available would be MIT licensing and so on and so forth, is anybody in military or in the context of commercial context can use your code. And so if you don't want your code or your software products to be used in those certain contexts, you need to take that into consideration with your licensing. Now, I work in television and media. <laughs> I don't think the code that I write is necessarily going to be used in those certain situations. But if you think about like a software package like the Tidyverse, DplyR, and all those, those packages might be used in those certain contexts. And so you know, there needs to be consideration on if you want to allow them to be used in there. Other things as well, regulated fields. Uh, if you work in healthcare, you work in the pharmaceutical inju or industry and so on and so forth, you may have certain laws that you need to comply with. And so certain licensing um, may dictate, or the certain licensing within your software may dictate your use within those specific contexts. Um, I'm not real familiar with them, but I just, I hear that sometimes, especially within like pharmaceutical research and so on and so forth. Um, you know, those are heavy, heavily regulated fields. And so there's a specific focus on what kind of software or, that you can use. The other thing is, is that your licensing is also could potentially, your choice on how you're going to license it could make your, your software or your package too, res too restrictive and nobody could use it. And so, um, we're writing packages to be useful for people to actually use. But if we choose a license that says, hey, you can't use it in this certain, certain situation or for these certain things, it may be too restrictive. And then the last reason, and one of the last and kind of major reasons that this is important is to also protect yourself from liability. Um, I'm sure everybody has seen this startup every time that you start our studio, but I've kind of highlighted it here for here, or for tonight's discussion. R is a free software and comes with absolutely no warranty. So just to kind of get our discussion going a little bit, when you read this, what does this mean to you? My initial thought is I am not here to solve your bug problems. So you can post something, but I am not going to maintain your code for your use. Warranty in my in my vocabulary implies that we're going to uh, current blotch uh, support another organization's use of our product, and there is no I don't know uh, a line drawn in the sand where it stops. 
you could even be legally obligated to help support, even though it's probably not going to happen. But what else? What else does this mean to other people? But again, to me, I don't think there's a there probably is a right answer. I just don't know what that right answer is. And it's obviously kind of gray too. So I'm just trying to get other people's interpretations. You see this every time it starts up. So um, well, you should see it anyways. I'd imagine they're not liable if, um, if they use are and then make a bad decision about whatever and you can't sue them for it. Yeah, that make yeah that makes sense. I mean, you know, um, you know, like the R core team, like they're you know they're developing free free software for people to use, and so they obviously want to maintain that you know mission of, of creating the software. But it's not their fault if you create an interpretation from the software that you're using and it causes some negative issue. And so the big thing is just like think of all the different applications where R is used. I mean, it's just unfathomable where all these things are, are used there's gonna be a mistake somewhere. And this small open source community is not gonna have the resources to like have like a, a boilerplate guarantee to say, this is gonna work in every situation in every single case. And so, you know, with R, it's gonna have kind of that warranty that's, you know, applied to the licensing itself. Anybody else, any other interpretations that people might have from reading this? I think I think one of my my favorite interpretations of this, and this was kind of interesting. Um, and there's a blog post that uh, people can kind of check out on their own here. Um, my favorite was when I was when I was in grad school. One of I had a professor who kind of had the same kind of viewpoint. They were a big SaaS user, and so their whole thing was like, "We're not going to use R." And you know, I'm not kind of bash this professor because they were actually really good at what they were what they did. Um, but they're like, "I'm only going to use SaaS because there's a guarantee." There's a guarantee they have software engineers, they focus on it. And I said, well, that's great. Um, but then after reading this blog post, it's like, a, if you actually dig into some of these statistical software, you know, packages and, and you know, um, tools that you can use, a lot of them have this no warranty that there is absolutely no warranty in which you use it or use it for. And so it's kind of funny, you can read this um, blog post on your own, but it goes through all kind of like the the major warranties that are available for different statistical packages that are out there going from like SAS, I think Stata, um, I think it even uses Excel. And so it was kind of interesting to see that, that, you know, even if you're paying for the software, they're not going to give you like a full guarantee that's going to work in every single case in every single place. And the reason is for that is because you don't necessarily know what context the, your stuff is going to be used in. So, but big picture. Um, so there's that, the no warranty. Uh, so, um, so how do we make heads and tails from this? Uh, how do we go about saying, okay, well, Colin, you said this is a complex, um, this is kind of a complex area. It's that kind of blending of software and, and law. How can we make heads and tails of it? Well, the book kind of talks about, well, just kind of put different licensing into two kind of major buckets. Um, the first bucket is going to be that kind of permissive licensing. These types of licensing, they're very easy going. They can be freely copied, modified, and published. And the only restriction is that the license must be pre preserved. And so um, some good examples of this would be the MIT license and then the Apache license. These are the most like common modern permissive li uh, licenses. The other second major bucket is copy left licenses. These are generally a little bit more stricter. Um, it's kind of inherent in the name copy left. If you're using code with a GPL license, and someone please correct me if I'm wrong, if you're using code from a GPL license, that GPL license needs to, to, needs to transcend into your software as well. Now I say that with some trepidation. Um, somebody please correct me if I'm wrong with that. In, in, the, in the GPL copy left thought process, if you use somebody else's code, you must cite that code and also make your code widely available. Therefore, if you're making it as a prerequisite or, or some kind of a, a source use of somebody else's services, not only did their code, you give citation back to that user credit back to that, that original uh, creator, but you also have to make your content freely accessible as well. 
Um, that's kind of the idea of the, the whole freedom kind of say, it, it's not technically free as in monetary cost, it's free as in freedom. You're widely sharing it with a larger audience for the purposes of moving humankind forward. So that's very yeah. big. Oh, go ahead. No, it's just, I'm, I, I love that thought process of moving humankind forward. It's like this, um, I don't know, uh, Star Trek sort of uh, mission log sort of comment that, you know, we're looking hundreds of years into the future. But... Yeah, I, 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 I resonate with that comment because I was, I went down the rabbit hole of this and then you start obviously getting into the free open source software movement and they talk about the, this concept of free software. And when you say free software, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a, a dollar amount to it or a price. Free software means it is freedom, freedom of knowledge and stuff. And so if you want to go down that path, you sure can. <laughs> and I did. And I still came out of it like, whoa, this is a whole other ecosystem that I can't dig in. But Ryan clarified it, right? And so it's it's giving credit. If, you, if you're using code that has a GPL license attached to it or a GNU GPL, whether that be version two or version three, you need to cite that code and then carry it over into your package while also making it freely available because that's the GPL licensing. Um, so we already kind of talked about this last point there in that conversation, um, but do, what questions do people have about these two major licensing categories? Okay, great. Uh, so then the, the next thing that the book kind of talks, well, the first thing the, the, the book kind of talks about uh, this question here, well, okay, Colin, you broke it down into two general buckets. How do you go about choosing a package or how do you go about choosing a license for your package? Well, I kind of broke it down into these uh, three kind of ways to make a decision. Uh, the first one is just go out there and explore what other packages are using. And so I just went through and I kind of picked some of the packages that I use quite a bit. Um, looking at them, uh, Dplyr, Dplyr um, uses MIT, Lubridate uses GPL, PER uses MIT, Survey uses GPL2, GPL3. I wasn't really clear on why there was both of them. Um, I think there's some incompatibility between two and three, but I don't know why there's two. Um, R itself, R, the programming language, has a GPL2. Um, you can actually access this licensing information. Oh, I had it up. No, 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 no. Uh, I actually had it up. I'll pull it up here, but you can actually access the license for the R programming language here. Um, it's under a GNU general public license in the about section of it. And you can actually get the text file that it is under version two. So that's kind of neat to kind of see that the actual programming language that we're using has a GPL license attached to it. Uh, let's see, um, R Studio. Many of us are our studio users, uh, uses a different GPL license. It uses an AGPL V3. And then um, Shiny uses GPL3. Now, what's kind of interesting about this, and we'll talk about this example a little bit later, is that I think, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not 100% sure because I was just digging through commit histories and stuff um, through some of these packages, is there was a point um, in the tidyverse history that they transitioned from a GPL license into MIT licensing. And so if you do some like background digging into it, it's really kind of interesting to see how those packages made that transition. There was one really good, interesting example with ggplot2 um, and Hadley actually added some like comments to it where Hadley was like, he first came out with the GPL license because he wanted to make it freely available. But as it kind of transitioned into like the tidyverse or started to be nested underneath the tidyverse, they had to make that transition over into an MIT license. And it's, so it's kind of neat to kind of go through the issue history and see like how those decisions were actually made. Um, and so I thought that was kind of interesting. So I guess it's just good to kind of go through and see, okay, what licensing are people using out there? Uh, maybe that will be informative for you. The other thing is, is you can look at the numbers uh, looking at the 2015 survey data of GitHub repos, and this is all programming languages, so not just R itself, uh, it said about 55% uh, use a permissive license, um, while only about 20% used a copy left. Now, the book's analysis, according to Hadley, 
was that 70% of CRAM packages use a copyleft, while 15% use a permissive license. And so I thought, and again, these are, you know, when you think about, I think, I think the book cites this as being a, a result from 2020. It's kind of interesting to kind of see the discrepancy here that with all programming languages, most of them are using a permissive license. Uh, you know, on GitHub repos, it's not representative of all programming that's going on, of course. But then with the book analysis, it's like, well, when it comes to cram packages, it's mostly using copy left. And so I, I don't know if that was an interesting thing to point out, but when I was looking, I was like, oh, that is kind of interesting. But with the five-year discrepancy, it might just be something different within the ecosystem that's changing. Um, there, I tried to do a little bit of background check into this because there is a data set available through a service called Google BigQuery. I don't know if people are familiar with Google BigQuery, but what they have is they actually have um, exports worth of data regarding different publicly available GitHub, GitHub repos. I tried to do a little bit of my own analysis on it, but um, I wasn't really confident in it because I had some trouble finding some like common repos that I knew about. So I wasn't really trusting the data. But if somebody is, has interest in it, um, I think they export that data every single day. So if you wanted to go and dig in and see like of all people who are using R within their, within their GitHub repos, what licensing might be available. So um, great idea for a blog post. I just didn't have enough time to verify the data. And I was just like, eh, why can't I find this one, this one package repo? It should be here. So I wasn't real confident in that data, but. I might have been doing something wrong too. Then the last part of it is if these two if these two kind of methods aren't informative to you, you know, seek further guidance. Uh, the book links this choose.license.com. Uh, uh, basically, it just walks you through different flows where you just answer specific questions. And then as you go through kind of these flows, it will kind of give you some more information on what licenses you could potentially choose for your package. Uh, let's see what else, what else, what else, uh, licensing for Col our licensing R by Colin Fay. I wasn't real familiar about this book until, uh, until I saw it linked here in the chapter. Um, I read a couple sections of it. I haven't read all of it, but it does look like a pretty good book that does a pretty good treatment of how you go about licensing, leasing, licensing your R code. And so I would highly suggest if this is a topic of interest, definitely check this out as well. Uh, doo -doo -doo. And then the other thing is, dun -dun -dun -dun, just like I said with my disclaimer at the start, if there's any more questions, go seek a legal professional <laughs> because they're more versed on this topic than I am. And so um, if you're having a trouble, if you still haven't been able to choose a license at this point, then you need to go talk to a legal professional. So, um, so with that, what questions do people have about what license you should choose or that process of making that decision? I guess one thing I'm curious about is if a lot of this stuff discussed in this chapter, including, you know, the taxonomy of different types of licensing, copyleft and permissive, if all of this applies to other programming languages as well, or specifically open source ones like Python or Julia. That's a great question. Would anybody want to answer that? I'm going to take a stab in the dark, but I may be completely false. So if anybody wants to uh, error check or uh, hold me accountable for my, my comments, please do. I believe in the world of computer science or programming languages from the very early, early times of, of this mathematics and, and, and creating uh, transistor logic, et cetera, I believe it's been these major organizations with government funding that has usually spawned some of these supportive language. And I'm, I'm talking about ARPANET, DARPA, uh, IBM, Xerox, et cetera. In that relation, in the, we'll call it late, well, early 80s to, to mid 80s, uh, during the uh, Microsoft and, and Apple Macintosh uh, debates, that was where Richard Stallman and, and uh, Linus Torvalds came out. So when we were talking copyleft and floss, that's really Stallman. If you're talking Linux, that's going to be uh, Linus uh, Torvalds. Um, they're not actually the same 
they're not of the same opinion of how to manage the Linux kernel or open source in general. Um, so Brendan, to answer your question, I'm trying to convey that in early stages of development, I would believe that there's probably some sort of pseudo monetary responsiveness to, uh, to the uh, development of these tools. And I'm talking about um, COBOL, uh, Fortran, C, C++, et cetera. Uh, and then as we move into the more modern day ages of Python, Ruby, R, uh, et cetera, there is a shift in more of a global support uh, across boundaries, national boundaries, global boundaries uh, versus having a commercial interest in uh, a product. Does that help, Brendan? I think so a little bit, yeah. Cause I was wondering like, as I get into other programming languages as well, if, you know, yeah. a lot of this, if I can just, you know, take a lot from this chapter and then use that as a jumping off point. I, I, I will tell you, you're not going to be incorrect for going the open source route. However, a lot of, a lot of individuals will want to try to find a uh, gain, uh, monetary gain support in their own interests of their development time. And that's perfectly legit. I completely support that. If you do, I would definitely close source your content and do not share it because somebody's going, you're, you're going to have this feeling of theft. You're going to have this feeling of somebody stole content from me. Well, you want to start out as being open and forward with everyone to say, here, take what I have and make it better. I, I, freely offer this to you and, and, and just give me the respect of giving me credit for it. Anyway. Right. Okay. Yeah, that, that's an excellent, excellent question and an excellent answer to it. Um, I mean, to give, to give a little background of my week worth of research, I mean, it, once you kind of dig into this a little bit more, especially when you start getting into that like free open source software movement, it's a whole other ecosystem and different viewpoints uh, that people have. But I mean, most, I would probably say that these conventions do transcend over to other programming languages. Um, I'm not as familiar with them, but you know, I'm sure you could probably find some more information, but this is like a whole other like can of worms that you open up and so, but I would, I would probably venture to guess that some of these general concepts do, you know, translate over to it. Cool. Excellent. Uh, so let's talk a little. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Isabel. Uh, about the the switching the licenses um, in the post that was written. Like, how does that work? Like, if it's switched from uh, MIT license to GPL license, is it like retroactive to anybody who had used the package in the past, or is it like as of the date that the license was changed? That's a, that's a great question. We're going to get to that oh, uh, in about four four more slides. Hey. Um, but that's an excellent question. Can you hold off on and we'll get an answer to that? Sure thing. Cool. Awesome. Well, I, I, I got a viewpoint on it. I got some other resources that might be helpful for that. Um, but hold that question. All right, cool. Uh, any, what, are the, what are the questions do people have? Okay, great. Uh, so... So the first thing the book kind of the next thing the book kind of talks about is splitting up how um, licensing affects like different um, types of code and what was contributed. It first kind of starts off talking about like code you write, and then it gets into code that's given to you, and then code that you bundle. And so the first thing, uh, the first way, the first kind of section that the book talks about is like code that you actually write. And so um, one of the reasons why you want to take into consideration licensing in regards to the code that you're writing is you have to you choose a license so that you can make it clear how you want other people to treat your code. Um, you're taking the time and effort to put it together. You're the copyright holder of it. We'll talk a little bit about you know who the copyright holder is, but um, uh, you get to choose a license because you're communicating to other people. This is how I intend you to use my code. Um, and so that decision is a way for you to communicate to those other people of how you want it to be used. Uh, when it comes to like going into those kind of two major buckets, you have permissive and copy left, which you talked about. Permissive, minimal restrictions. If you want more specifics of it, you can dig into the MIT license here. You can read the actual text of it. Um, 
And then also what's nice about it is there's some convenience functions within use this that helps you set this up. So you don't have to physically go copy paste the, it for you. You can just run these functions for any of the licensing that we talk about. Uh, if you're interested in the different licenses that are available through use this, you can use these different functions here, MIT, GPL, AGPL, and so on and so forth. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to talk about all these because we just don't have enough time, but just know that these are available to you. Uh, same thing with copyleft. If you want to use a GP, GPL v3, you can use the GPL3 license. Again, this is... Um, there are certain restrictions for that when you put that on your specific code. There are some um, other types of uh, licensing out there. Uh, there is the CC0 or um, Creative Commons licensing. Uh, this is really talked about in relation to if you're creating a package that is mainly just data that you wanna make freely available to people. Um, a good example of this that I found, I'm gonna see if I can find it. Um, but many of us are probably familiar with the, uh, most of us are probably familiar with the, the New York flights data. So if you've read r for ds New York flights is highlighted quite a bit in that, that book. That is under a Creative Commons or a CCO license. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to bring up as an example too, although this isn't necessarily package related, uh, you've probably seen the Slack bot in the welcome or the intro channel quite a bit in the R4DS learning community, but those are CCO are under CCO license. So any code that you contribute to that community is under a CCO license and people don't necessarily need to give you credit for it, for giving those answers. Somebody should correct me if I'm wrong on that, but um, it's just a good example of where CCO is applied in relation to code. Did I get that right? John Harmon, and if you're watching this later and I did not get that right, let me know because I know you manage this, um, but that's the way I interpreted it. The other side of this would be um, a CC BY license. Uh, you know, these require attribution when data is used. I'm also going to say this as well as code. Um, some good examples of this would be um, individuals' blogs. A lot of the time, if you if you see some um, blog content out there, um, a lot of people put a CC BY license on this code. So some good examples of this would be um, Julia Silge's blog. Um, many of you may not be familiar with Julia Silge. Um, she's she's uh, a major contributor to the Tidy Models packages. I think she also works for our studio as well. Um, she puts out a lot of great content. Uh, but anything that she puts on her blog is under a Creative Commons or a CCO. Um, as long as you, you know, do uh, give attribution, you can use that information. Same thing with uh, you, he, she. I think that's how you pronounce it. Again, I apologize if I mispronounced that name. But for people that are uh, familiar with Knitter, um, he has a license for his blog as well. It's under a CCO as well. But pretty much any kind of blog or any, well, I shouldn't say all because some may not have this licensing on it, um, but some people put a CC or a CC by license on this. And so it's just kind of neat to see that their licensing is on that. Uh, our book is a, uh, a CC by license as well. So you can look at the license information for it. I pulled it up. You can see that it is a Creative Commons non-commercial, no derivatives, so on and so forth. So it's just another example of that. And then if you uh, if these don't work for you, you can also use a propriety license. Um, just know that if you do use a proprietary license, CRAN will not distribute your package. So you need to be using um, some of these more generally accepted ones if you want to distribute via CRAN. So what questions do people have in regards to um, these different licensing types? Excellent. Uh, so the copyright holder. So um, who has the right and the ownership to the code that you're writing in your package? Um, when I was reading the when I was reading the chapter or was when I was reading some of Colin Fay's um, our licensing stuff, uh, his first kind of comment that he had was once you pretty much write the code, you're the owner of it. Um, now it's also dependent on whose time you're working on though. Um, for, uh, when it comes to copyright ownership, it's 
it's who owns this code. Um, when it comes to copywriting, the copyright holder gets to choose what type of license they put onto that package or code that you're writing. Um, and that also means that they have the right to potentially change it in the future. And so a thing that was talked about in the book as well is that if you have multiple people contributing to your code, and this could potentially even be companies that are contributing to your code, uh, they may, depending on the licensing that you choose, may have copyright to individual contributions within your code. Now, that's a very broad statement. I'm sure there's probably some little niche areas that I don't know about in that statement, but generally um, what people contribute to the code, unless you have, uh, what is it? A contribution licensing agreement, they own that contribution. And so that's gonna become important with Isabella's question when it comes to changing the copyright um, and how you actually go about relicensing. And so this will come up again in our conversation. So who is the copyright holder? Well, uh, code that you write on your own time, you're the copyright holder. Uh, you know, as long as, as long as you're on your own time and you're writing it, you're the copyright holder. Uh, copy or code written on company time, your employer is the copyright holder of it. Uh, this one was a little bit vague to me, but like if you're um, like a consultant or you're a contract worker, if it's code written under a contract, you're, copy, you're the copyright holder unless that contract describes otherwise. I have never worked in that arena before. So I, I guess it's going to come down to the contract that you have with the people that you work with and who you're developing it for. But I say that very loosely because I am not, I've never been in that situation and two, I'm not a legal scholar, but um, has anybody ever done any work like this where they've created code under a contract and had like an explicit agreement on who the copyright person was? I definitely haven't, but it makes me curious, like say you get a grant to, you know, create a certain package. Um, I wonder how, how does that work if that's like technically under contract? That is an excellent question. Uh, I'm going to drive you to your legal team at your organization to ask that question. My guess would be it would, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. My guess would be that if it's, if it's funding that code development, whoever got that grant or whoever is the PI on it owns it, but I'm not sure. Well, Ryan, I, I think you're going to say I, something. Well, I was going to just ask about academia, right? So if you are a student, that's one thing because the university or the college that you're attending, they are accrediting your work, your research, that's part of your learning path, et cetera. Uh, and so therefore any creation that you make is going to somehow be tied back to that university. If you are an employee of the university, that's where things get funny because now you're working as a paid service on behalf of the university. And I know I'm not a lawyer, so please don't uh, uh, come at me from that angle. What I was gonna offer Brennan was, um, have you heard of like uh, these websites where you have like coders you know, uh, on the fly? And I'm, I'm Angie's list is what comes to mind, but that's like contracting for home ownership and, and you know, handyman type stuff, uh, painters and whatnot. But they, they have these websites where you've got a code, uh, a, individual that will do services work for you in development of a code base, you pay them a certain quantity. The third party organization that's allowing this meetup to occur um, somehow manages some legalities between the um, provider and the providee. Uh, so therefore the, the monetary exchange occurs and you've got your services rendered. Therefore it would fall under that contracted form of license. I would think as the copyright owner, the person that is paying for the development of intellectual property, you would want that to come back to you because that's money you've invested into that person's services. We're getting funny. I'm, I'm not a legal person. I apologize, especially if I'm not using the right terms. No, I, I think I get where you're going and, and that makes sense to me. Um, first, I have to get grant funding, so I'll worry about that at a later point in time. Speaking from my experience, I'm also not a lawyer. This was a very specific circumstance. There was a very big distinction between contracts and grants. Uh, under contracts, anything created under a contract was owned by, by us uh, and not the contractor. 
versus a grant which you know we would work on this um like the the goals of the grant the outcomes of the grant etc but it was really up to the grantee to fulfill those so some of the points of discussion were like is there going to be code is this code going to be public do you need funding for dissemination and things like that um but as the funder like we wouldn't actually um like own the, that code it's up to the grantee to set like the standards at least again that was just my experience <laughs> All, all excellent answers. Um, I have a couple of thoughts rolling through my head. Uh, you know, one, it gets a little bit murky too, because I know some of us are, are from different parts of the world and in different jurisdictions. And so um, it may be totally different. I'm speaking from a perspective of what I understand from the US legal system, which is very little. But, you know, for example, like Rex, Australia might be completely different in how intellectual property is used. And so, um, you know, the biggest thing is, is, and I think Isabella had a good point is, is like getting those expectations set up right at, up front of like what is expected of it. And one experience that I've had as I transitioned into my role is, you know, specifically in a professional analytics role is, is code was never developed as a part of my position. But as the analytics has kind of grown, code development has become more of a kind of a centerpiece of it. And so it's starting to have conversations of who actually owns this code and, and you know, who's developing it. And if we are going to create an analysis for somebody outside of it, who owns what? And so most people would probably say doesn't matter. But when it starts getting into like kind of the like the actual creation of it, it starts to matter. And you need to have those conversations like Isabella was saying is like, you know, be that person in the in that meeting to say like okay well what are your expectations and what is going to be the ownership of it because at least you've had that conversation of it but those are my thoughts go talk to your legal department <laughs> um first and foremost don't get in trouble so <laughs> but what other questions do people have about um copyright holders and then I guess the other thought that I had too is, is like code written on, on company time. That's completely fluid. You know, the space that I work in, I'm also interested in that space outside of work. Who owns that, you know? And so it, some of the stuff gets kind of, kind of gray. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts and, 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 and Isabella, I'm getting to your question. I know I kind of tabled it for a second, but I'm getting there. Um, so uh, when it comes to actually putting it together, there are some key files that are needed for it. Instead of me kind of going piece by piece through this, I'll just show them to you really quick. Um, I'm going to pull back our example here from the regex excite package, which, okay, well, oops. sorry about this. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, so when we look at this, the first thing that we're going to have is in our description file. It's going to have um, your key value pair here with your license and then your specific license here. You're going to have the license.md file, which is just going to be a copy of the actual licensing agreement within your package. This is also going to get added to your um, .r build ignore file um, because this is not submitted to CRAN um, when you actually submit it when you build your package. And then also there's this other file that gets created, um, which talks about the year that the licensing was applied and then who the actual copyright holder was, which I assume is coming from the description file. Um, but that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, I'm not gonna dig too much into that just for the sake of time, but um, if you use the use this package and those convenience functions that are available for you, it will automatically set this all up for you. You don't have to do it. You just have to make the decision. Uh, there are more, more licensing available to you. Um, you know, the big thing is, is although your choice may be flexible, it's best to follow convention. And the reason why I say this, um, you know, your, it, the decision's up to you, but um, just understand that not all of your users are going to be familiar with licensing. And in fact, you know, I'm just going to talk about my own like experience with it before this discussion tonight in this chapter, I really didn't consider like it was a big deal. But as I've kind of gone down the road, I was like, 
and I've read more about it, I'm like, wow, this is actually a really big deal that I should be considering if I'm going to make this open source. But when you think about your general user, not everybody's going to think about that. And when you think about thinking about using something that's not convention, most people might not necessarily know what that is. So if you have a very restrictive license, nobody's really going to know about it. So just take that into consideration that if you are going to use an uncommon license, people may not be familiar with it. And then also some word of caution for writing your own license can cause specific problems. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, the license surrounding JSON, um, but there is a, a JSON specific package. Um, this has a, I wanna say an MIT open source license, but there is a line that was added, like a line that was added to this um, in this licensing that said this, the software shall be used for good, not evil. Um, and if you kind of do some digging into this, although there might, um, there is some conversation about what the intent of this was, and I haven't spent enough time researching it, but if you dig into this, you can see that there is a lot of problems with this one line because of the interpretation of good and not evil. And so there are some organizations when talking about free open source, if people want to integrate JSON into their software packages, they have to interpret this license line. Although there might be good intent for this, it causes problems down the road for people who necessarily would potentially want to use this. And so, um, although you have a choice to use whatever licensing you want, keep that in mind that that might have effects later down the road. Um, check out the book for other licensing options. And then there's this big, long alphabetical list that's available to you. Um, uh, I looked at it real briefly, but there's a long list of all kinds of licensing that you can choose. Pretty much anything that your needs could be filled, you could potentially get a license that will help you. So now to get to relicensing. <laughs> uh, when it comes to relicensing, the best plan is to not relicense. That being, take the time at the front part of it to do some pre-planning on what your licensing is. Um, because if your package becomes popular, you start having many you know, contributors to it and you need to relicense later down the road, that may be an issue because as we'll learn later on with some examples is if you have a lot of contributors to your package and you've made a licensing decision that you need to relicense later, you need to get approval from everybody who provided a significant contribution to that package. And there is the potential that you may have a group of people who say, we don't want to relicense. And so a good relicensing strategy is at the start to sit there and say, and to think about it, what type of licensing strategy do I want at the start and choose one that you may not change. Now, uh, it's possible that you have to change it. Um, so in the situations where you do have to change, the first thing is you, is you need to identify um, non-trivial, or you need to find all, this, this statement's incorrect. You should find all contributors that um, have provided a significant contribution. Um, so this is a good example of why we should be using some version of version control, um, whether that be um, GitHub or Bitbucket or some internal Git service that you're using because it allows you to scan your Git commit history to see who has actually made contributions to your package. Now, it's good to make it open to the public because everybody can see that information. Um, once you identify people that have had major contributions, um, we can have a discussion on what major contributions are. Um, I haven't really put a solid definition to that. I think it's people who have gone above and beyond just fixing typos. Um, but that's not like a hard and fast rule. And someone please correct me on what you would consider like somebody that's actually contributed a lot. Once you kind of get identify all of those major contributors, you want to uh, check who the uh, copyright holder is. Um, and then once you do that, you're gonna identify if you have any bundled code within your package, because if you bundled code, um, what code you bundled and what licensing that, that has been applied to that bundled code, um, that may limit what type of licensing decisions you can actually make or relicensing decisions that you can make. 
Then the next step is that you have to get approvals from all of your con contributors. Um, the book suggests that if you are going to make a relicensing decision, uh, what you need to do is just create a GitHub issue and then just basically have people say yes or no to it. And so basically, do you agree? Do you not agree? And then from that information, you can make a determination if you can make the change. Uh, I think the book says that everybody has to agree to it. Um, but somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that. Once you get all those approvals, then you should be good to go and make the change. And then you bump, you change the license from it. Now, uh, this is not just all theoretical. There are some examples out there. The book kind of talks about two of these examples. There was one done by generics, and then I think it's Cove R, I think is how you pronounce that. Um, they've actually gone through those situations where those were actually changed. Uh, uh, this stuff. And so here are some examples. Here's that example of relicensing generics as MIT. Um, you can see that Hadley, you know, put an issue in GitHub and basically said, hey, these people here who have made contributions, do you agree to this licensing change? If they agree, then it gets changed. Now, this one was really, really simple. Um, some other ones that I came across, uh, well, the Cove R one was pretty interesting because there was a lot more contributors to this one. But, and I think maybe somebody with more background information could add to this, but I think there was a contribution by Oracle to this specific package. And so I kind of read through this issue to kind of see how this went. And there was some back and forth on this change from, uh, I think a GPL, where'd they go from uh, change license? Yeah, so they were changing to a GPL three. So they were going from a MIT to a GPL three. And there was some back and forth about that change. And so it was just really kind of interesting to kind of read through some of these comments to see what people were talking about to what effect that might have on the package itself. So it was, it was kind of an interesting read. The other example that wasn't in the book that I came across was there was this issue that was put into ggplot2 number um, 4236. Somebody asked the question of why are you relicensing ggplot2? Um, so I think there was a transition for tidyverse code from like GPL licensing to MIT. And there's some really interesting questions in here and a really interesting conversation back and forth. And even Hadley himself adds some comments to why this transition was needed and why it needed to take place. And so, um, so these are great examples. If you're considering a relicensing change, these are great examples to go through and see how this process was actually handled. So that was a long answer, but um, Isabella, what or anybody else, what other questions do people have about this relicensing process? Did I answer your question, Isabella? Yeah, thank you. That's the best way. I think, I think what I what I really took away from this part of relicensing, and I know I'm really close to the nine o'clock right now, is this is a great example of why you should be using version control. Um, because if you use version control, and especially if you have, if you're creating some type of package that is open source, it gives you that commit history to go back to and see who's made contributions, who do I need to take into consideration for when I make these changes? Um, and in fact, I think when I was looking at the ggplot2 relicensing change, they had so many contributors to that one package that they actually had to do three issues of people because there wasn't enough room in the issue text to add every single person to it. So they had to have three different ones. And I was just like, whoa, this one is just a massive change. So if you get a chance, I would definitely check out that um, that change for ggplot2 because that one seemed like a pretty pretty good example of like the complexities of relicensing change. But to go back to it, take some time at the start because if you take some time to choose a license that works for you, then you may not necessarily have to do relicensing in the future. So I am right at nine o'clock. So I don't think I'm going to finish the last few sections of it. Um, I think we'll probably save this for next week, uh, uh, probably about another 15 minutes to kind of get through the rest. 
Um, but I was looking at next week. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about chapter 10, which is object documentation. We don't have anybody listed here. So if anybody has any interest in, in taking on this chapter, um, just let me know. You can either let me know after the session here or, or post in the Slack. If not, I'm more than happy to take object documentation again um, if, if nobody wants to take it. So don't feel completely obligated if you don't want to, but if people do, you know, let me know. So with that, uh, I guess I'll open it up for any questions, discussions that people may have about what we've discussed. Um, and again, if you have if you have to jump off, more than welcome to hang out or um, have a good rest of your evening. So I'll open up the floor for any questions or extra discussion that people would like. Well, and in the world of media, in the world of, of journalism, in the world of especially international borders of servers being located in different countries, sharing of data, et cetera, have you ran into issues with sharing information within the, the department that you work for or with? Oh yeah. Like, I mean, I, well, go ahead. Let me, let me, let me change the way I'm asking this. So from your delivery as a, as a instructor versus being an employee, do you see a difference between the two agencies and how they manage the, intellectual rights of what it what it is you're developing and, and providing for accreditation maybe i'm an, maybe i think i'm answering that or asking that purposefully well uh well you know it's a pretty big question um well from from the education portion of it i mean uh you know that, you know, I only, I only teach, you know, I only teach for that. I don't really contribute a lot to the actual department for that portion. Okay. When it comes to like the analytics development where I work, and this is different than anybody, um, is I don't think I, we haven't really had these conversations about mm -hmm. licensing and who owns this, you know, uh, I think there's a, you know, I think there's just an, an inherent understanding of like, you know, I'm developing it on, you know, organization time. And since I'm developing it on organization time, they're the copyright holder, right? And so they can make any yeah. decisions of it. Granted, we've never made anything openly. We've never made an open source package that's freely available. And so we haven't had to confront that. Do I think we're ever going to get there? No, I don't think so. Right. Um, and I, I don't think there's any interest in doing that. But you know, I don't think that, but you know, there's organizations that we potentially could work with that like, you know, Isabella and Brendan's cases that we're developing mm -hmm. code and analysis for other people. And that's a potential and that's a or grant funding. Yeah. Grant. Oh yeah. Grant funding. Cause we're a nonprofit, you know, we'll get grant mm -hmm. funding too. But I also think too, in the space that I work in, there's not a lot of conversation about it because it's just not a thing that, I, you know, most people are just good with their software that they have that they purchase and they use, but there was never like a conversation of like developing software right. or analytics tools or anything and so i think this is a space that will grow into i guess is the short answer well, to it any of any of the team members are, are welcome to, to comment i i wanted to share a quick story when i joined this this current organization i work for the i'm a linux nerd uh, i really I, I i'm hardcore into the into the open source community etc and so i wanted to I wanted to join a Linux con, right? They have these every year. It's kind of like the R Studio uh, the conventions, et cetera. Well, I wanted to praise our our proprietary commercial platform for being, you know, Linux based, Unix based. So I went to the product line manager and I said, "Hey, it, it, with your permission, can I talk about this at this Linux con? You know, I want to I want to praise, you know, this really awesome stuff we're doing for the rail industry, et cetera." And he goes, "No, you can't talk about it. It's proprietary." <laughs> I stopped. And I said. Well, okay, uh, please define what is proprietary, what I can and can't talk to. And he goes, no, you can't, you can't attend. If you want to be an employee here, you can't attend because that's proprietary mm -hmm. and, and we, we can't talk about it. And I'm like, no, those aren't defined limits. I, I'm asking a very specific question. So as an instructor, as a, uh, as a uh, delivery for our support of our product line, um, and the reason I'm asking you, Colin, about the, the instructor side, um, 
I run a very razor knife edge on almost being, you know, giving away intellectual property, but on the same token, being supportive uh, and, and trying to cut off so that there is still a monetary need for, for our services in delivery. Uh, it's, a, it's a balancing act. And so I, I was curious about that. Um, it's, it's fun to bring up that debate. I don't know if everybody has that opportunity uh, to share that experience in a commercial versus open source mindset. I mean, one thing that I have, and I don't want to dominate the conversation because I want other people's viewpoints of it is just, um, we just haven't really thought a lot about it, you know, and, you know, I don't think anybody's really considered it, but we have our organizations just really kind of, because we're also part of the university, we're also a separate organization, we're part of the state. So uh, if we ever get in that position, I'm going to have to talk to somebody in a legal department. So, and universities have, have great legal teams. So I'm sure they would be more than happy to speak to with me about that. So, but what other perspectives do people have about that? Does anybody work for an organization that's developing like software-based products? No. I got um, some papers in RA from a grant to develop in our package, but it's, it's all open source and it's academia, so they don't, they don't expect to make money out of it. Yeah, the academic side of it's just different. I mean, because, you know, sometimes you just don't think about it. You're like, well, we're not going to make, you know, we're not going to make the next Facebook. We're not going to make the next Google, but it's still intellectual proper, you know, it's still intellectual property. And so, you know. I don't know, but that's hard for me to guess. It's not always just about monetary value, you know? It's because your, your stuff that you could create could be used for bad things too. So, you know, um, and, you know, I always think about that too, especially with like, uh, you know, I'm not developing anything like this, but military applications or things that, you know, like algorithmic bias and, and stuff like that. Like if you create a model that, you know, is inherently biased and you apply it into an application, do you want your software to be used in that way? And, you know, I'm not at the forefront of those types of questions and that kind of product development, but those are important questions that people are asking. And so, um, you know, and I kind of, and I had kind of had that thought with like dplyr and all that too, like these, these tools get used in so many different contexts that, it's just, you know, you don't know what people are using them for. And so it's like, you know, you want, you know, I would expect, and I am ensured that the tidyverse people, you know, are want their stuff to be used for good, but you just don't know. So it's just like, that's a licensing decision. Your licensing can dictate potentially what your stuff can be used for. And in MIT licenses, you can use it for basically anything. So, but I don't know. That kind of went down, that went off the rails there, kind of went off-roading there for a little bit, but that's just big picture thoughts that I've had. What else, what other questions or comments do people have? Cool. Uh, any questions on the chat? Let's see. So Ryan brings up uh, battles between Google and the Borak language. Some stuff with Sun Microsystems. Yeah, I mean, there's always a bunch of examples of like acquisitions and like different. It's a whole other world out there with especially like big tech, well, even small tech too, of acquisitions and how people acquire stuff. And go ahead. Well, to kind of answer Brennan's earlier question, uh, when we were, when I was trying to give a, a timeline, right, this, this IBM Xerox timeframe of like early 60s, 70s, 80s, and then moving into more 90s and 2000s, um, this was a pivotal moment because Java Sun Microsystems was a very open source or a very open community of, of acceptance and, and, you know, wanted to kind of help everybody, right, very open. Um, when Oracle came in, I'm not, please, I'm not painting a bad picture. I'm just giving the, the kind of scenario at the time. Uh, when Oracle acquired 
Sun Microsystem. They wanted to close it off. It just so happened that the Android operating system had some lines of text that were Java oriented. Oracle came after uh, Google uh, for uh, copyright infringement. And so Brennan, to your earlier statement or earlier question about the open source, closed source, this mindset kind of scenario, that's a good example, this use case of, of legalities, this user, not user, copyright law, legality of how you actually manage your product in its future future goal setting. Kind of like what Colin was mentioning before, you got to plan this out kind of early stage. And the first question I always ask myself is, do I want to make any money from this? Because if I do, I'm not going to share it with anybody. And that's kind of getting into some Porter's Five Forces models and building barriers and all this other sort of businessy sort of questions. In the relation of sharing and, and, and moving, helping others, you're very open. It's, I want this code to go everywhere. Does that help, Brendan? I, I, I had you in mind when I was adding that comment. Uh, don't feel obligated to read 60 pages of a Supreme Court ruling, but anyway, it's there for, it's there for credit if needed. No, thanks for that. I'll make sure to skim it later. Um, I was looking up because um, I was just curious if there are any cases where you people got into legal trouble with art packages or stuff like that. I didn't find anything, at least not that came up in the first Google page uh, search results. But um, yeah, just that our studio got into some um, lawsuit stuff with data camp in case anyone wants to look into that. There's some gossip there. But it's a completely different matter now than related to licensing and packages. That's a good question. I I don't know. I've never. I I think it comes back to that no war. I think it comes back to that no warranty thing too. Like you know, there's no warrant. There's no warranty for depending on the license that you choose. There's no warranty to it. So if something does go wrong that causes damage in some way, you know, I, I think that there, and again, I'm, I'm speaking with a very limited knowledge of, 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 uh, of liability, because I'm sure there's probably some very gray areas that they can get into, but it's that no warranty kind of clause is like, regardless of how you use the code that I develop under my licensing, it you take on full liability of it. Um, uh, like a, trying to think of an example here so like i was reading something about like data loss like if you're going to use some of these packages within your systems and i'm thinking i don't know you work in healthcare or something and you need you know you're a heavily regulated field like you have people's health data for some reason and that data or you use a package that interacts badly with some system and wipes a bunch of healthcare data granted you should have backups and and that should be taken care of that happens, the damage isn't on your code that you're developed. It's it's no warranty. Like you need to know how this works. You need how it integrates with your systems, the liability of any issues and damages that may happen with that, whether that be data loss, system loss, system break. That's that's on you. Um, but I don't know. There's probably there's got to be something out there. Um, but I haven't. And I'm not really informed on that kind of arena. I think the R core team also does a pretty good job of like, and, and I keep going back to that system loss thing, but like, you know, why there's not supposed to be any executable files in your R package. One of those reasons is because, you know, executable files can put some malicious code into it that could potentially, you know, do damage. And so, you know, there's some like kind of stop gaps for some of that stuff, even though there's no warranty for it, but I'm just, I'm talking out loud now. So <laughs> just thoughts. What other questions do people have? Anybody else have any other questions, concerns, or any, um, anything else? All right, cool. Well, I, I'm going to jump off. So I really appreciate everybody's um, conversation tonight, and then we'll finish our we'll finish this up about another 15 minutes of licensing discussion. If anybody's interested in the object documentation, let me know. 
If not, I'll be more than happy to take that on for next week. But other than that, everybody else have a good rest of your night and I will see you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.